Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Hello and welcome to you all. I invite you to learn about a digital ethics initiative that centers around the use of portfolios in the next few minutes. We can then deepen our learning on day three of the conference in a workshop. My name is Christina Höppner and I work at Catalyst IT in Wellington, New Zealand. We do have offices in other locations in Aotearoa and abroad where we support our clients with open source solutions to a diverse range of business requirements. I focus on learning and professional development as the project lead of the ePortfolio platform Mahara. The project is going to celebrate its 15th anniversary this year. Over the years, students and faculty have been using Mahara extensively for a range of different types of portfolios and increasingly professional organizations explore electronic portfolios for certification and accreditation scenarios. So why would you want to keep a portfolio? I find that the idea of portfolio thinking as promoted by Helen Chen and here illustrated by a definition from Wiki Suter's blog summarizes it well. Folio thinking is a process of engaging in the collection, organization, reflection and connection that leads to a person's ability to speak intelligently and concisely, i.e. tell stories, about one's learning experiences, what they mean and their value, and how the experiences relate one to each other. For me, this comes down to five activities, conveniently all starting with a C. While the first activity is not really mentioned in the definition, I find it is a prerequisite for the others namely to create, create your learning, um, participate in learning, create your learning evidence. Because then we can collect that and curate it, which includes the organization and sense making of the evidence, converse about the evidence with others and also connect with others and other pieces of evidence. Through these five activities, you engage more fully with your own learning and don't just do that on your own but also with others to support your own learning. Now, how do digital ethics come into play? We are not operating in a vacuum and to learn on our own and thus need to be mindful about our interactions, how we engage with others, what tools we use, where we store our evidence and so on, so that we do that responsibly, feel safe and also brave to share parts of our learning story and respect other people's rights. Because these conversations are important, ABLE, the Association of Authentic, Experiential and Experience-Based Learning, set up a task force on the topic in 2019, and I'm a member of it. The result from the first year of investigation is a set of 10 principles, and in the second year, we are now exploring three more namely diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging and decolonization, visibility of labor and evaluation. Each principle follows a common structure for consistency. It includes the principle itself, an abstract, several strategies that can be used successfully to adhere to the principle, scenarios that exemplify how you might encounter it and references. Feel free to explore the first set of principles at tinyurl.com slash digital ethics 01. Now let's take a look at the principles themselves. Principle one, support. I think we can all agree that it is vital that portfolio initiatives are supported in order to make them a success. The support does not have to come from just one campus partner but should also involve others like the library, the writing center, and the offices for accessibility. Principle two, promote awareness. We cannot assume that students know about digital ethics when they start their portfolio journey. Instead, instructors and staff are responsible to make students aware and help them navigate the space by providing examples and teaching about copyright amongst others. 
Principle three, practice. Practice takes you to mastery and so also in the portfolio space. In the beginning, it may be difficult for students to select the best appropriate evidence, reflect or give constructive feedback. With enough practice, they will become more comfortable with it. Principle four, respect author rights and reuse permissions. That applies to portfolios no matter whether they are shared privately or publicly. A platform can support portfolio creators by making it easy to attach a license to a piece of evidence. Principle five, access to technology. Be mindful what devices are required for students to access the portfolio and ensure that students who do not own appropriate devices themselves can have one available through your institution. It also means having support available to handle the technology well. Principle six, privacy. Portfolio authors should always have the right to decide with whom they want to share their portfolio. That should be a conscious decision, thus allowing authors to keep their portfolio private per default and then share it either with a select audience or the public as it is appropriate. Principle seven, content storage. The principle highlights the right of authors to ask where their data is stored and who has access to it. It touches on the responsibility of authors to know what they are agreeing to when they accept the terms and conditions and privacy statement. Principle eight, cross-platform compatibility. While it should be a given today that portfolio platforms work across devices, this principle does need to be taken into consideration when an institution reviews the implementation of a particular platform to choose one that can be used by everybody. Principle nine, accessibility. Accessibility is a constantly evolving area. In Aotearoa, for example, one in four people have a permanent disability. That does not take into account everyone with a temporary one like a broken arm when you cannot use your hand properly. Portfolio platforms should follow current established accessibility guidelines to allow everyone to use the technology. Principle 10, consent for data usage. Can students delete their data? Is their privacy of personal information ensured at all times? Does the platform comply with university and other relevant regulations? These are just a few of the questions to ask in this principle. Now, these were the 10 principles from the first year of investigation into digital ethics and e-portfolios. Since September 2020, we've been looking into other themes that are complex in nature. Because we are still working on them, they don't yet have a number of them. One big theme to focus on this year is diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging and decolonization. Conversations around this principle are incredibly important as this conference demonstrates, and it is the responsibility of instructors and tutors to provide safe environments where students can express themselves and their cultural beliefs in their portfolios, making them feel welcome and encouraged to participate. The next principle, visibility of labor, recognizes that developing, implementing, creating, supporting and assessing portfolios is labor intense and should be compensated where appropriate. And for portfolio authors, it needs to be taken into consideration when giving portfolio assignments. They are not done quickly, but can take a considerable amount of time to create. Last but not least, portfolio evaluation is also a principle. It considers the process, inclusion, reflective practice and alignment with objectives and outcomes of the portfolio work so that it fits into the wider educational context and is not perceived as standing to the side and not fitting in. Now, these are a lot of principles to take in. Many of them overlap and it is up to each institution and its members to decide what is important to them. I encourage you to take a closer look at each principle. Ask yourself if you're already employing some of these strategies, 
which strategies might be missing, and how these principles may inform your own practice. If you are interested in exploring this topic further, I invite you to come to my session in a couple of days on day three of the conference, and which we will explore the DEIBD principles in a workshop setting. I look forward to your feedback and comments on the principles, and you're welcome to get in touch via email with me so that I can share your thoughts with the rest of the task force.